Good evening, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. I hope everybody's had a good day so far. Thank you for being here. I know you have to be here, but thank you for being here anyway. My name is Melissa Galatas. I am the outreach educator for the Gulf Coast Center for Nonviolence. The Gulf Coast Center for Nonviolence is the victim services agency for domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking victims on the Gulf Coast. We serve the lower six counties. There are agencies just like ours all over the country. So I started off at the Domestic Violence Center about six years ago. I started off as a resident advisor working in-house and shelter with the residents living there. And then for about the last five years, I have been an advocate in criminal and civil courts and in felony courts on mostly domestic violence cases and a few sexual assault cases. Um, I'm also a survivor myself. And the statistics on this, I know a lot of you might be thinking, well, why am I even here? Why is the Scarlet Pearl doing this? This does not relate to me. About one in seven men and one in four women will experience severe physical assault by an intimate partner at some point in their lives. And that's just the severe physical part. That doesn't count the emotional abuse, the verbal abuse, the psychological abuse. So I would assume, I think I'm safe to assume, that that number is much higher than one in seven and one in four. So the Scarlet Pearl recognizes that and because they have so many employees, chances are people have experienced this or experiencing this now or know people who have experienced this or are experiencing this now. You might interact with people in the casino who are exhibiting these types of behaviors and someone might reach out to you for help. So they want to make sure you have all the information that you need. I'm not going to stand here and lecture everybody about physical assault. We all know what that looks like. We all know what that is. I'm not going to be showing you pictures of people with black eyes. You don't really need that. What we're going to talk about is what causes this? Why does this happen? And the root of it is what we call coercive control. So I'm going to define that for you guys. First of all, we're going to talk about coercive control, define it, the different types of control. We're going to talk about why it is so hard to leave these types of relationships. Then we're going to talk about the lethality risk. There are certain signs that we can be on the lookout for to let us know whether or not a person is in actual danger. And then we're going to talk about the hope that there is in surviving and escaping and the resources that you could use for yourself and for other people. So some housekeeping first. I want to give a trigger warning. We're not going to talk about anything graphic or explicit. I'm not going to be showing you any graphic photographs. But these are very emotionally heavy topics. So I encourage everybody to please check in with themselves emotionally. If you need to step out for a second, take a deep breath, take a break, get something to drink that is perfectly fine with me. I'm not a counselor and I'm not a lawyer. I know lots of counselors and I know lots of lawyers, so if anybody needs a service like that related to this topic, please let me know and I can refer you to somebody. I'm going to avoid using gendered language. And the reason for that is we see domestic violence as a crime against women. Now, while women certainly are more likely to be murdered by their partners if they're being abused, men are abused just as much. Men are controlled just as much. I know people now who are men who are in those situations. It also doesn't discriminate, domestic violence doesn't discriminate against any type of gender identity, any type of relationship, heterosexual relationships, homosexual relationships, relationships with parents and children. I see a lot of people in court where their adult children are abusing their parents and vice versa. It doesn't discriminate against race, ethnicity, economic status. This issue touches every single person, so I want to make sure that I use language that doesn't alienate anybody or make anybody feel left out. And number four, confidentiality. I'm gonna be around afterward if anybody wants to come and talk to me. Everything that you have to say to me is confidential and I won't repeat it, including to any of the managers here at Scarlet Pearl. And I'm gonna get into that part, the confidentiality part specifically, at the end. So there is a researcher named Michael P. Johnson, and he kind of specializes in categorizing different types of abusive relationships. When I was working court cases, a lot of times we would have people come in and say, hey, there's no control in this relationship. This is not a pattern of behavior. We're having really bad economic times right now. You know, we started yelling and screaming at each other and the neighbors called the police and this is why we're here. That is situational couple violence. 
It really depends on the circumstances. It's usually triggered by stress. And it's not necessarily dangerous because one person isn't trying to constantly control the other person. The next type of violence is violent resistance. That is when someone has been abused for so long that they start to resist the violence by using violence themselves. What once was their acts of self-defense have become acts of retaliation. And the one we're gonna talk about today is called intimate terrorism. And the reason why Michael Johnson uses this very strong word, I mean, when we hear the word terrorism, we think about suicide bombers and war and that kind of thing. But when someone is in a coercive, controlling, abusive relationship, they are terrorized. They are prisoners in their own home and the bars around their prison no one else can see. Coercive control is present and is constant and there is a higher fatality risk in these situations. So we're about to get into that. Coercive control, what is coercive control? There is a forensic social worker named um, Dr. Evan Stark. He wrote the book on coercive control. It's actually called Coercive Control. And it is, it is defined as a pattern of behavior which seeks to take away the victim's liberty or freedom and strip away their sense of self. Domestic abuse is primarily a crime of liberty in which violence is used by the abuser to maintain control of the victim. It's not really about the violence. The violence is a tool that abusers use to maintain control of their partners or their family members. Dr. Stark says, uh, he didn't say this in his book, he said it in a lecture that I've heard him do. Remember, partner abuse is not primarily about what abusers do to their partners. It is primarily about what abusers keep their partners from doing for themselves. When we get into relationships with other people, we've got to recognize that we are both autonomous individuals with rights, with hopes and dreams, and choices. When people who are abusive get into relationships, they feel an ownership over the other person and their violence is motivated by wanting to control that other person. We're gonna watch this nine minute video. It is an interview with these two brothers named Luke and Ryan Hart. They are out of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom in 2015 put into place coercive control legislation. They made it illegal for you to control your partner. We don't have that law in this country. It's incredibly difficult to prosecute it. But the United Kingdom has done this. And the first person that they were able to prosecute with this law was in 2016. It was a man who would not let his girlfriend wear makeup. He made her dress in unflattering clothes so that men would not be attracted to her. And he wouldn't allow her to have a cell phone. They prosecuted him for that, criminally, because it is the foundation of domestic abuse. Brian and his brother Luke were in a coercive controlling relationship with their dad growing up. They didn't realize this at the time because he never not one time physically assaulted them. He never physically assaulted their mom or their sister or them. He was just mean. He was mean and he created all these rules in the house that they couldn't obey because they were too difficult. So as they got older, they moved their mom and their sister away from that house because they didn't think that they would be able to live free lives there as long as they were with him. And five days later, their dad killed their mom and their sister. So I'm gonna let them tell their story and then we're gonna talk about it a little bit afterward. There are calls for a major campaign to raise awareness of coercive control. Following the case, Blatt's heart shot and killed his wife, Claire, and daughter, Charlotte, after he inflicted years of psychological abuse. Lance Hart also took his own life on that day in July of 2016. We can talk now to the family's surviving sons, Luke and Ryan. Good morning to you both. I'm going to ask first of all, how are you? Um, we're, we're actually doing quite well. We've, we've been quite busy raising awareness this week, so we're quite tired, but it's been a productive week. And Luke, why do you think, I mean, you have such a powerful story to tell. Why do you think it is important to tell this now because for three years, I think three years ago, uh, the laws on coercive control were were introduced, and that was the case of you and your family. 
That's right. So um, we had actually only moved our mother and sister away from my father five days before he killed them both. We found out on the news app, we both worked in different countries, what had happened. And the first thing that struck us was just confusion. Because our father had never been violent towards us. And then the violence seemed to come out of nowhere. It seemed to kill our mother and sister out of nowhere. Because we'd always thought domestic abuse was about violence. But it's only since we were in the police station in Spalding, we looked up behind us, and six months before the first control legislation came up, and we saw financial abuse, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, all the other mechanisms our father used to control our family. And at that moment, we realised our father's behaviour didn't come out of nowhere. He'd controlled us our entire lives, and that control ratcheted up until he killed our mother and sister. And when you consider murder to be the ultimate act of control, suddenly what seemed to come out of nowhere made perfect sense to us, and that's what the hope of change works on. But Ryan, one of the things I uh, know you've talked about already is, is the notion from the outside looking in, there were no signs, effectively, as to what was happening within the household. Can you give people a sense of the kind of thing you were witnessing, but maybe didn't realise at the time? Yeah, so, I think what is key is to understand that coercive control isn't so much what it's done to you, but what it can after yourself. So our father slowly took away our freedoms, so for one, he kept us financially poor. He wasted it and gambled money, so we had no money to spend. And he used that as an excuse why we couldn't go and see friends, why we couldn't take part in sports. And over time, we ended up restricting our own social lives because we felt we couldn't actually take part in friendship and society. And over the decades of that slow abuse, we ended up controlling ourselves and limiting our life. And the reason we moved our mum and sister away from the family home wasn't because we were scared our father would kill them, but because we were scared they could never live when they were in the home with him. And you'd left home by this point? We'd left home, yeah, as we said, only five days before he killed them. But we found out in the police investigation he was planning on killing all of us for months before we even had to move out. Because that control over our lives, he could see that slowly disappearing because we were able to provide financially for mum and our sister. It's, a, it's for anyone watching, who may be in this situation, and like, you two didn't really know right. you were in a coercive, abusive relationship. Yeah. There were little things that happened. I mean, you mentioned a couple. There was an incident I read about, or a, 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 a form of routine, your daily tea at 4.15 instead of 4.30. Can you explain? Well, yeah, so, so our father almost created a whole system of laws in the house that we had to abide by. And, and they were designed so we could never meet them, so we always had an excuse to basically just yell at us. So the bus always got in at half past four, but our father from school, that. right, and, and our father always cooked in at quarter past four. So he either burnt it and then blamed us when we turned up the food was black, or he put it on the plate, ate it, so ours was cold, and he would yell at us. And we just couldn't make the bus get there any earlier. But it was those small things where eventually you begin to believe you're the problem because you're always doing something wrong, you're always to blame, all these things happen that are your fault, and that's what the abuse tells you. But you were high achievers at school as well, weren't you? Um, you did really well in school, so, and the point being that perhaps teachers, and I'm, I'm not passing any criticism onto the education system in this sense, but it wasn't something to look at, you weren't going to be considered as problem children. Yeah, so that's one key issue we want to raise, is a stereotype of an abuser is not necessarily someone who's violent who creates those physical scars and bruises. And also, as pupils, we won't be um, snapping, like, detention um, pupils. We were overly compliant and quiet and highly successful, not out of determination, but because we were afraid of failure. And that comes from our home environment, where we could not fail at home. That was not an option. So in our school life, we were those same kids who just got our heads down and worked hard because we had no other option. And I think what is key is we need to change the stereotypes we're looking out for in abusers and also victims. Not all victims are going to be aggressive. They might be corresponding to physical attacks, but our environment was cultivated over decades, so we slowly accustomed and adapted to be able to survive. And so we became, as you said, overly compliant and fearful. And that made it safe at home. And that necessarily, necessarily didn't show itself in school in the stereotypical ways. I mean, you, you've both been very brave and very honest, and, and you know, the way you tell the story of what happened will be impacting. I just wonder what, I, I'm assuming a lot of, a lot of people uh, have responded, have they? Because, it, as you say right at the beginning, you wouldn't know from the outside. If this is happening in a household, as it was in yours, 
You may well not know, and these could be the people living next door to you, they could be members of your own family, you just wouldn't know. And that's the thing, is we lived in the murder for 25 years and didn't know. The services to our family didn't know, our friends to our family didn't know. Because I think, when we talk about domestic abuse, we talk about violence, but domestic abuse is about control. Violence is what abusers use to get control, it's a subset of control. And when you take a step back and, and talk about control, it all makes sense. And I think that's one of the messages we'd like to convey, is that in the media as well, sometimes the media part of society, they assume abusers are violent men who are angry, who've lost it, and they're violent out of anger and emotion. But our father was cold-blooded, it was calculated, it was based on beliefs and control. Can I ask one thing, is that if someone is in that circumstance, there will be people listening to this even now thinking, I, I hear some of the things you're saying corresponding with our lives. They might be thinking, what do I do? Do I go and see? I go to the police and I say, do you know what, my dad or, or whoever it is in, in the family is stopping us from doing things sometimes. And in the head they might be thinking, it just doesn't sound like much. You know it was an enormous thing. But they might be wary of thinking, it just sounds like we're not, you know, what's the problem? I think we would encourage anyone with any concerns, not only in themselves, but in their friends, to call the National Domestic Violence Helpline and just express what you've seen, because by saying it's not that bad, that's what we've said our entire life, it's not that bad. We kept thinking that our life could be worse. And that's not how people should be living, by thinking it could be worse. We all deserve to live freely and happily. And I think if you are seeing some of those elements we talk about, talk to the experts and raise concerns, and don't just live and um, give in to, to that life that you may have ended up in. And also one thing in our case is when women leave, that's when they're most likely to be killed by their partners. So we didn't realise. And actually, if you think you're being abused, don't suddenly leave because that can trigger that loss of control in the men. They feel that you're leaving is irreplaceable to their control. That can make them um, quite dangerous. There's a great fear to, um, for anyone who is watching who wants to make their situation known um, of the consequences, but also life after. Mm -hmm. How long has it taken you two to kind of get to this fairly composed and compassionate place? So, yes. I think what was key for us was when we lost one child, we lost our purpose in life. And it wasn't until we started speaking out about a year, year and a half after the murders, that we started to find new meaning. Um, and we started to, I guess, make something good out of what happened. We didn't want our father to win, essentially. Had we just lived a life of regret and sacks, he would have essentially won in destroying our life too. So, what we tried to do is live a life which is meaningful, the moment child will be proud of. And I think part of that is speaking out about what we <coughs> suffered, hopefully raise awareness. Part of that is how we wrote our own book, Operation Lighthouse, to share our story more widely. And we hope to just go into schools maybe one day, just talk to anyone who brings a different to us, and do what we can to hopefully make sure our story is going to begin. Well, I, I'm sure I speak on behalf of a lot of people watching you, amazed by your composure. You know, it's quite remarkable how you tell your story. It will impact a lot of people. I think you've got someone to that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. If you've been... Partner abuse is not primarily about what abusers do to their partners. It is primarily about what abusers keep their partners from doing for themselves. One of the things that Luke and Ryan say, well Ryan particularly says in this video that really strikes me is that they didn't move their mom and sister away from their dad because they thought he was going to kill them. They didn't think he was going to kill them. They moved their mom and sister away from their dad because they didn't think that their mom and sister could live while they were in the house with him. Because he had taken away their liberty. So how is it that abusers gain this power? How do they gain control over another person? Well, in the case of Luke and Ryan, they were born into it. When abusive people are your parents, they don't have to do anything to gain that control because they automatically have it. But in romantic relationships, it slowly builds over time. Now, if I were to go on a first date and that person were to punch me in the face, chances are I'm going to call the police, I'm going to be angry, I'm going to prosecute, I'm going to point my finger across the courtroom and say, that person did this to me and never speak to that person again. But if that happens to me after I've built an emotionally intimate and a physically intimate trusting relationship with somebody, 
I'm going to be a whole lot le less likely to pursue or do anything about it. So these relationships start off as a whirlwind. It's romantic. It's like the movies. There's love bombing involved. You start to really attach your heart to this other person. And with, in any healthy relationship, you start to gain trust with that other person, confide in that other person. Healthy relationships are supposed to be safe spaces where we can tell our secrets, tell our struggles, tell our fears, and get support from that person. Our relationship is growing and it looks like it's going to the next level, so honey, I think you really need to know I did this really bad thing one time that I'm really ashamed of but I've healed from it, I've moved on, but it's still a part of my life and my story, and I need you to know about it. Honey, I struggle with drug addiction, and I have in the past, or I have now. I struggle with mental illness, or I'm afraid of failure, I'm afraid I'm gonna fail at my job. And in healthy relationships, those things are safe with that other person. In abusive relationships, they're not. And they get weaponized and used against you in the future. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So while all this love is going on, the emotional intimacy is going on, physical intimacy is going on, little red flags start to creep in, like jealousy. Now jealousy is a perfectly natural emotion. Everybody has felt jealous every once in a while. But what people in healthy relationships do is they say, hey honey, I'm really insecure about this person you're hanging out with. I really just need your assurance that you're with me and you're gonna be faithful to me. And if not, we probably need to have a different type of conversation. What abusive people do is they feel that feeling of jealousy and they stamp it out by saying, you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that, you're not allowed to hang out with them. And that jealousy becomes possession. Then they start to lay the foundation for sets of rules for you to obey. Just like with Luke and Ryan, a lot of these rules are set up so that you can't obey them. Their bus got home from school at 4.30 every day. Their dad made their meal at 4.15 and would punish them if they were late. So they could never obey this rule that he made because it was impossible. And then the abusive person will start to be critical of things that make you, you. They start to criticize your taste in music, your taste in clothes, your taste in friends, the things you want to do, the things you're interested in. And they start to make fun of you, and pick on you, and be mean to you. What's really tricky about when these red flags pop up is that all the romance is still going on. And jealousy is a perfectly natural emotion in relationships. Sometimes that happens, and sometimes it might even be flattering that they're so into me. They're a little bit jealous, right? Laying the foundation for sets of rules. It's perfectly healthy for couples to set boundaries with one another and to have conversations about those boundaries. And then, a lot of times, it's really fun to joke around with your partner, pick on each other with your partner, have gentle ribbing with each other, you know? Make fun of each other sometimes. But these three things that can sometimes be healthy cross this line, where they become abusive over time. So while all of that is going on, these red flags are popping up, but you're still totally into this person, and you're like, okay, we wanna take it to the next level, maybe we decide to move in together, and a lot of people nowadays are deciding to move in together faster than maybe they should because it is a, an economical decision. Housing is really expensive. And you really need a roommate nowadays. So that's a perfectly reasonable decision to make. But when you make it with somebody who turns out to be abusive, you're trapped in their home. Especially if you merge your finances together. Because they can see everything that you're doing, they can tell you what to do with your money, with your money or they can restrict your access to money. Then they start to isolate you from friends and family. And this happens very subtly. You'll introduce your partner to some friends, and then you go home and have a conversation about it, and they're like, I don't know, she just really rubbed me the wrong way. I don't think you should be hanging out with her. And slowly over time, they introduce these divisions to keep you isolated. And then finally, surveillance will start to demand to look at your text messages, look through your phone, look through your emails, they'll scrutinize every single friend you have on social media, every like you receive. Why is that person liking your picture? What's the history behind that? Are you not telling me something that I need to know? Right? 
I've been single for a long time, but every time I date somebody and it looks like it might end up being something, I always tell them, the minute you want to look at my phone or dig through my text messages, I'm breaking up with you. That's not a thing that's gonna happen. I'm not going to be surveilled ever again. And again, it's, it's hard because merging finances can sometimes be a good decision for the couple. Sometimes there are people in your lives that you need to set boundaries with and you don't need to hang out with. You should be able to, as a couple, leave your phone around and be transparent and not have secrets. But abusers take all of these things to the next level. And that's when it becomes abusive. So how do they maintain this power and control once they've gotten it? This is what we call the power and control wheel. And I know most people can't read what this says, so we're gonna go through these one by one as they go on. On the outside of the wheel, we have physical violence and sexual violence. Just because you're in a relationship with somebody does not give them the right to demand sex from you whenever they want. You still have to have consent within those relationships, including marriage. Within the power control wheel are other types of violence, tools that abusers use to keep you trapped. I've seen this also as a cage, where every tool the abuser uses to keep you trapped represents another bar in the cage that closes you in. So the first one we're gonna talk about is coercion and threats. Remember those things you confided in your partner about, those fears, those secrets, those struggles, they use those against you. If you leave me, I'm gonna call your boss and tell them about your drug addiction. If you leave me, I'm gonna send all your friends those intimate photos that you should have been able to trust me with because we're partners. I'm gonna send that to other people. That's where coercion starts to come in. And then threats, it can be a threat as simple as I'm gonna show up at your job and make a scene if you don't do such and such. Or it can be threatening to kill them or to harm them. The next one is intimidation. This comes in many forms. If I know somebody and they give me a dirty look and I don't have a bad history with them, chances are I'm just gonna be like, hey, what's wrong, are you okay? I'm not gonna be afraid of that dirty look. But if somebody who has been emotionally abusive and physically abusive to me looks at me a certain way, I'm gonna check myself and know, okay, I'm breaking one of those invisible rules that they've created and I need to submit before something bad happens. Another way they intimidate the victim is by saying, if you call the police, they're not going to believe you. I know the police, I know the judges, which usually is not true, but that's a form of intimidation that they use. Emotional abuse. I could go on and on and on about emotional abuse. That phrase, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. That is a lie. I don't know who decided it was okay to teach that nursery rhyme to children, because I remember learning it at a very young age. It's just not true. Every client I've ever worked with has said I would much rather be physically abused than emotionally abused. This person who's emotionally abusing you will pick on the things that you don't like about yourself. And they'll bring you down, they'll belittle you, they call you names. And they tell you that you can't do anything in life, you're worthless. I'm the only person who will ever love you. One of the things that I experienced in one of my relationships was one of these uh, foundational rules, these uh, unreasonable rules that I had against me was that I was not allowed to laugh at other men's jokes because that is sexual to throw your head back and open your mouth and laugh. So what did I do in social situations? I stopped laughing. And what happens to a person when they stop laughing? That will make you sick, right? And in my case, I attempted suicide. That's what happens when people are emotionally abused for a really long time. They start to believe those lies about themselves. Isolation, this one is the most dangerous one. In my book, anyway. I have two guy friends right now, two guy friends who I used to be really close with, who are dating abusive women. And I'm not allowed to talk to them, because I'm a threat for some reason. I want to reach out to them, I want to text them, but I can't. Because if I, don't, if I do, then the women that they're dating will punish them for that contact with me. Sometimes you could bring your partner over to your parents' house or to your friend's house for a party or a get-together, and then they act crazy. They make a big scene, 
and they make it to where you don't want to bring them around anymore, or your friends and family say, hey, we like you, we want you here, but we don't want that other person there. And usually what the victim does is they choose to not go to those people's houses anymore. They just don't go there. They don't tell the abuser, you can't go there, but I'm going. They just don't go at all. So it isolates you from your friends and family. Minimizing, denying, and blaming. When an abusive act occurs, someone who is abusive is not going to take accountability or responsibility for those actions. They're going to minimize it. That didn't hurt your feelings that bad. I didn't hit you that hard. Or they'll straight up say it didn't happen. That didn't happen the way you remember it happening. You're making it up. You're bipolar. I cannot tell you how many times people have told me they're bipolar. They're not bipolar. They're not. Their reason has told them that they're bipolar. To make them question their very sense of reality. I've been in situations where an abusive act has occurred to me or happened to me and I've approached the person and tried to get an apology or confront them about it. And then two hours of my meetings later, I'm apologizing and wondering if I'm losing my mind. And then because of the isolation, you can't check reality with other people. You just have to trust this one person that what they're saying is true. Blaming. The alcohol made me do it. I was drunk, I didn't know what I was doing. Alcohol does not make people abusive. Drugs do not make people abusive. They might make it easier. They might be liquid courage to get them to do it when they might not otherwise do it, but if they are controlling, they're abusive, whether they're drinking alcohol or not. And my contention too is if you know you're violent with your partner because you drink alcohol, why are you still drinking alcohol around your partner? I had a court case one time where a guy assaulted, a young man assaulted his mom. He grabbed her face really hard and caused all these bruises on her face. And we were in criminal misdemeanor court and he pled not guilty. And I was sitting in the room with the prosecutor and him and the prosecutor was like, okay, so you pled not guilty, you mean you didn't do it? Or are you, are you telling me you didn't do it? And he was like, oh, I did it. She just wouldn't shut up. What else was I supposed to do? And he really believed, if I come into court and tell them my reasoning, surely they will understand that it was her fault and not my fault. So the beliefs about control that Luke mentioned in the video are there in these abusive people. Using children. Abusers will use children to maintain control. They'll say, if you call the police, if you try to leave, I will take the children away from you, we'll never see them again. Or they'll model this behavior for the children, and the children start to do the same things. Economic abuse. You've merged the finances. You suddenly don't have access to your own money. That person now has the power to take away your debit card, to take all the money out of the account, to force you to have an allowance. In some cases, they might not want you to work. Honey, I'll, and it starts off like, honey, I'll take care of us. You don't have to work. I'll take care of us. I'll do all that stuff. You can stay at home and work on your dreams, which is great. That sounds great in a healthy relationship. If you can trust somebody to do that, that's fine. But for an abuser, that just keeps you from being able to have money. This one is called male privilege. And it only applies in heterosexual relationships where the man is the one being abusive. And where this comes into play is certain people in society have this idea that women are subservient to men and that they have a specific role and a specific place that they have to maintain in the household. Now I'm all about traditional, we set up families, if that's what you want to do. In fact, it's one of my dreams to be a full-time stay-at-home mom. If the man wants to go out and work and make all the money and the mom wants to do some manages the household, that is fine, as long as that is a mutual, agreed upon arrangement. But the minute a man says, I am the king of this castle, I make the rules, you obey the rules because you are a woman, that is when it becomes abusive. Another way that I've seen this used is some of the abusers we have worked with have purposely sabotaged their spouse's birth control so that they stay pregnant to make it harder for them to leave. That actually happens a lot more frequently than people talk about. So it's my contention that abusers 
don't use violence because they lost control of themselves. They're in control. People come into court all the time and say, oh, they snapped. They just snapped, they got angry, and they snapped. No, they're in full control. It is strategic. Abusers use violence when they have lost control of their partner. And they use the violence in order to regain that control. This is a public service announcement out of the United Kingdom. I love this one because it perfectly encompasses exactly what I'm talking about. It's about 40 seconds long. A loving partner shouldn't take away your choice of clothes, your choice to wear makeup, or the music you choose to listen to. They shouldn't take away your purse or your car keys. And a loving partner shouldn't take away your phone so that when your daughter rings again and again, you can't answer. Controlling behavior takes away your choices in life and the things that make you, you. If your partner is controlling you, it's domestic abuse and against the law. To speak in confidence, call Scotland's Domestic Abuse Helpline. It's a crime of liberty intended away to take away your independence and your sense of self. So if these relationships are so bad, why doesn't the person just leave? I would be so rich if I had money every time somebody told me, why don't they just leave? It's really hard to do. It's one of the hardest things in the world to do. And people who are abusive make it harder. This is called the cycle of abuse, and I'm gonna go through these one by one. On average, it takes a victim of abuse seven to nine attempts to leave before they actually successfully leave. That is on average, seven to nine times. So I've met with clients in, at, at, uh, in court who've said I've gone back three or four times, I must be stupid, I must want to be abused. No, it's just really hard to do. And every time you try to leave, you learn and you try again. So we can start anywhere in this cycle because these are going on constantly within abusive relationships. But we're going to start with the tension building phase. So let's say I broke that rule and I laughed at another man's joke. I'm going to feel the tension. Like, okay, something is about to happen. The abuser is increasingly critical and hard to please. And the victim is left walking on eggshells waiting for something to happen. Then a violent incident occurs. This could be either abuse, like physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, emotional abuse, or verbal abuse. Then the reconciliation phase happens. We sometimes call this the honeymoon phase. Oh honey, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do it. A lot of this minimizing, denying, and blaming we talked about earlier happens. The alcohol made me do it, or you just made me so mad, you know exactly how to push my buttons. I wasn't in control of myself. But it's cushioned with sincere apologies, sometimes even groveling. You remember how you took that vow in sickness and in health? Well, I'm sick and I need help. Thank you for sticking with me. I'm sorry that my sickness is hurting you, but thank you for sticking with me. I promise we're gonna get counseling together. I know you wanted me to go to church with you for a long time. We'll go to church, it'll get better. Then there's a period of calm. Things seem really healthy again. The victim has hope that the abuser has changed and some of these problems are, uh, promises are fulfilled. They are going to church. They are getting counseling. Usually when I meet people in court, they're right here. We get to court and they're like, oh, they're being so good right now. She has not been abusive to me at all. She's really changed. She's been in rehab. Everything is good. And then as soon as the charges get dropped, the tension builds again and the cycle starts over. So what is it about this reconciliation or this honeymoon phase that is so powerful? The romance still plays a role in this relationship. You love this person. You can see how they can be good if they would just choose to be good. The victim wants the relationship to work. It is so much easier if the abuser's promises were to come true than it would be to leave. There are still good times. We still have fun together, right? We're still attracted to each other. There are moments of reminiscing on the good days. You remember when we first met? When we used to walk on the beach? It was so great that it can be like that again. And abusers do this thing where when they cause a violent incident to happen, instead of saying, I did this to you, they say, 
This is a thing. This is a trauma that is happening to us. That we, as a couple, need to get through together. So then it bonds you together further through that trauma. Well, what if you're at the point of your relationship where you're like, you know what, I don't love this person anymore. I'm tired of being with this person and I can't handle it. And you want to leave. You decide you want to leave. The emotions are no longer there. Well, the financial abuse has left you without access to money. The isolation has kept you from your family and friends. And they're tired of trying to help you because they don't want you in this situation anymore. The children are being used as leverage to keep you from leaving. So many clients tell me I can't leave because I would rather be hurt and be with my children and make sure they're safe than be safe and be away from my children. And the constant surveillance leaves the victim unable to reach out for help. If somebody's reading all your text messages and your emails and your social media and listening to your phone calls or tracking your GPS location, you, you can't, you don't have a safe way to contact anybody for help. So then this cycle continues. I heard a really great analogy one time that if someone is afraid of going to the dentist and they have a toothache, their fear of going to the dentist is going to outweigh the pain of that toothache until the pain becomes greater than the fear. Until the pain of staying in that relationship becomes greater than the fear of leaving, you're not gonna leave. So, Ryan in that video hit the nail on the head when he said it, don't minimize what's happening, even if there isn't physical abuse, by saying it's just not that bad. Because we shouldn't have to live like that. Everybody has the right to breathe the air of a free person, to make your own decisions for your own life. But there are situations where it becomes dangerous and potentially fatal. There is a domestic violence researcher in the field, her name is Dr. Jacqueline Campbell, I'm obsessed with her. I've read so many of her papers. She's fantastic. And she did a number of studies. And through those studies, she developed what we call the lethality risk assessment protocol. And law enforcement officers use this assessment, advocates use this assessment. And it's a questionnaire that we give to victims and we ask them, of these things, are these things happening in your relationship? And if they answer a certain percentage of them, then chances are that they could potentially be murdered by this person. And we use it to make sure victims know how much danger they're in. A lot of times people don't know how much danger they're in because it's easy to minimize these actions. But it also lets us know which cases we need to be paying special attention to. So I'm gonna go through quickly some of these signs. If physical violence has been used in the past, chances are, that if the abuser used physical violence in the past and it worked to control their partner, they're going to use it again. If the abuser threatens their partner with a weapon, or this could be any weapon, it could be a gun, it could be a pencil, it could be trying to snatch the wheel of the car while you're driving. That jealousy we talked about, that possessive jealousy, that is a big sign that this could be potentially dangerous. Control of the victim's daily activities, where they go, who they talk to, whether or not they're allowed to enroll in school, whether or not they're allowed to go to work, whether or not they have to report who they sat next to, who they talk to at work, who they're allowed to laugh with. Stalking behaviors. I don't have this statistic for men. I'm not sure that it exists. I need to find it. But of the women who were murdered by their intimate partners, 80% of them were stalked before they were murdered. Nicole Brown Simpson was relentlessly stalked by O.J. Simpson before she was murdered. In fact, she and her friends used to joke about it. They'd hear a tap at the window and say, oh, it must be O.J. Assaulting the victim while they're pregnant. This one is actually related to jealousy. Any time spent away from that person who is abusive is a threat to them, including children, unborn children, friends and family, not just people who are in romantic or sexual competition. Any attention away from them is a threat. If the abuser threatens self-harm, if you leave me, I will kill myself. That is a huge burden for somebody to have to carry. And they know that. 
And we want to take every threat of self-harm seriously because we don't know, this person might be having a psychiatric crisis and we need to get them some help. And at the same time, they might also be trying to manipulate that person into staying with them. You shouldn't have to stay in a relationship because you're afraid that that person is going to hurt themselves. And then the abuser threatens homicide. Our brains are wired for pattern recognition. And so when somebody tells us something like, I'm going to kill you, it's easy for us to minimize. Oh, maybe I heard that wrong. Maybe they're joking. Maybe they didn't mean it that way. But what I tell my clients is if somebody tells you they're going to kill you, believe them. Especially if these controlling behaviors exist and they feel like they own you. And I've had more than one client who I have told that to where this actually came to fruition. If the abuser abuses drugs and alcohol, like I said before, it doesn't cause the violence, but it's certainly a factor in escalation of violence. If the abuser is unemployed, a lot of times people who are unemployed and feel like their partner is going to leave them, they don't have anything to lose. That makes it dangerous. But it also makes it dangerous if the abuser doesn't have control of their own money or their own finances and they're dependent upon the victim. That could trigger a sense of loss of control. If they threaten to harm the children. If the victim has a child that is not the abuser's biological child, that is also a jealousy tricker as well, because you're not supposed to have a life before them, right? If the victim has tried to leave in the past year, that's a sign that the abuser is likely to escalate their control tactics to try to prevent you from trying to leave again. And this final one, if I can't have you, no one can. I'm sure you guys have heard this on a Lifetime movie or something. I read it in police reports all of the time. And someone with this attitude, if I can't have you, no one can, there's a risk with that attitude that they might kill their partner and probably also kill themselves. Now, Dr. Campbell did two other studies, and she's repeated these studies, and other people have repeated these studies. Uh, one is on strangulation, and the other one is on gun violence. So the definition of strangulation is pressure on the neck by any means. This act, this act of abuse happens a lot more often than people realize. And it is a felony in most states. In Mississippi, it's not only just pressure on the neck, but it's also suffocation. If someone tries to suffocate you, or they try to put pressure in your chest so they can't breathe, that's a felony in Mississippi as well. And the reason it's a felony is this act increases the homicide risk by 700%. And people who were strangled, if strangulation is introduced into an abusive relationship at least one time, they are seven times more likely to be killed by a firearm later on. And then gun ownership. If there is a gun in an abusive household, the homicide risk increases by 500%. And Dr. Campbell actually testified before Congress about this very statistic, and that is the reason why it is a federal crime for people who have been convicted of domestic violence misdemeanors or have protection orders against them. It's illegal for them to own a firearm. Okay, so I just said horrible things at you guys for like 45 minutes and I'm sorry. And it seems very hopeless and very helpless, but me and so many thousands and thousands and thousands of people in this world are a testament to the fact that it is not helpless, that it's not hopeless. So how do we break this? How do we break this cycle and unattach ourselves to these people? Leaving abuse is a process, is not an event. It happens over a long period of time. So if you're trying to leave an abusive relationship and you haven't been able to do it, give yourself grace. It's hard. If you know people who are in abusive relationships that are trying to leave and you're tired of them doing that, give them grace. It's really hard. It is a slow extraction, it's a tedious unstitching. It requires planning and strategy. It's hard enough leaving a healthy relationship, right? But imagine trying to leave one when that person doesn't want you to leave and they might kill you if you do. So the first step that I suggest in trying to leave an abusive relationship is fight the isolation as much as you possibly can. Chances are you've burned a lot of bridges with the people who you love because that's what the abuser wanted you to do. Reach out to them. Try to find community. 
as much as you can because community is the key to being able to get out. And if you are a person who knows somebody who has been in this situation and they keep coming to you over and over again about the abuse and they keep going back, I understand that that is exhausting. It hurts to see your loved one get hurt and it hurts and it feels helpless because you can't really make them leave. What I suggest is, yes, set boundaries for yourself. Don't sacrifice yourself emotionally for that other person, but please create safe spaces for that person to return to. Be that person who the abuse victim knows. If I call them, they're not gonna say, I told you so. If I call them, they're not gonna say, well, remember you know, three months ago when we talked about this, you said you were gonna leave and you didn't then, why not? We have to create safe spaces where they feel like they can say these things because the abuser wants us to cut them off. The next thing is safety planning. Safety planning is very detailed. I have a, like a two and a half hour lecture on safety planning alone. It is different for every person. Some of the basics of safety planning are things like figure out ways to maybe stash away money so that you can have some if you have to leave have an overnight bag hidden somewhere, just in case you have to leave, make sure your important documents are somewhere, make sure you know where you're going to go if you have to leave. Make sure there's not a tracker on your car or turn your location off on your phone when you do leave, things like that. But the safety plan isn't the same for everybody. Some people it is appropriate to reach out to law enforcement or to pursue criminal charges. For some people it's not appropriate. For some people, they need a protection order and that would be really helpful. For some people, it will make the situation more dangerous. So the third and final thing I suggest doing is contact victim services agencies like ours. One of the biggest parts of victim advocacy is doing safety planning with that person. Having them call and say, hey, this is my exact situation. We know lawyers and judges and police. We know the domestic violence laws at the back, like the back of our hands and we know how to navigate them to help that person create a safety plan that is best for them. Sometimes the safety plan is really quick and can be executed right away. Sometimes it takes months of strategic planning. So these are the services that we have available at the center. None of them cost any money. And the purpose of them is, is to eliminate the obstacles that abusers put in place to make these relationships hard to leave. So number one, we have two emergency shelters on the coast. They're both in confidential locations and they are open for men and for women, and for children uh, who need to escape abuse. We have counseling for adults and for children. When you're being emotionally abused, there's this tape that gets created in your head that repeats and plays about all the horrible things about you, all the lies that this mean person has said about you. And that tape exists even when that person is gone. And it takes a really long time to erase that tape. So the goal of counseling is to erase that tape and not just replace it with good things. Replace it with the truth. When you've been abused, you've lost your identity, so now you're like, who am I? You have to give yourself permission to like the things you like again and make the choices you need to make again. That's what counseling is for. We have housing and relocation assistance. We do not want somebody trapped in an abusive home because they're afraid of homelessness. We have victim advocacy, which is what I have done for about five years. Victims, just like defendants, have rights. And they have the right to be there at these proceedings. They have the right to be informed. They have the right to make their voices heard. And so as advocates, we make sure that those rights are not violated, to make sure that they are emotionally supported. Because a lot of times in court, the judges and lawyers and cops, they're just all at work, right? So it's our job to be there emotionally with the victim, to explain all of the legal stuff that is being thrown at them, and to create a safety plan with them. And to make sure they're not forced to do what they don't want to do. If they don't want to testify, they shouldn't have to. We also have lawyers for divorce and custody. We don't want somebody stuck in an abusive marriage or unable to fight for custody for their kids because they can't afford a lawyer. So we've got two of those for free. And then, like I said before, we do extensive safety planning, and those safety plans change constantly because of what the abuser is doing or if the circumstances change. We have victims' compensation assistance. The Attorney General's Office has really great victim services programs. One of them is victims' compensation. 
If you are a victim of any crime in this state, you can apply for victim's compensation. And it reimburses things like um, medical expenses, travel expenses to and from court, relocation expenses if you have to leave. The AG's office also has an address confidentiality program. This is one of my favorite things, it is so cool. If you have left an abusive situation and you've relocated and you do not want that abusive person to find out where you live, you register your address with the Attorney General's office. They assign you a false address. You put that address on your driver's license, you register to vote with it, you register your kids in school with that address, and then they forward all of your mail to you. The only way anybody else will get your address is if you disclose it. We have a therapeutic preschool for children who have witnessed domestic violence. A lot of times they are repeating these behaviors, so we address it at a young age. We have a hands are not for hurting curriculum. And we also address the trauma that they've dealt with. We have education, which is what I'm doing right now. We do this for all kinds of organizations. We train law enforcement, we train judges, we train lawyers. Uh, I go to drug, drug rehab facilities, we go to schools. We have a volunteer program. The volunteers do all kinds of things. One of my favorite parts of the volunteer program is we train sexual assault victim advocates to respond to hospitals so that people who have to get rape kits or sexual assault forensic examinations aren't by themselves and have emotional support. So we serve, we serve survivors of homicide, domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. So if you have a friend or a family member who has been taken by homicide, that is a very special, intense type of grief. We have a special counselor for that, and she also advocates for those families in court as well. The final thing I have to say about this is that these are our three core values at the center. Number one is confidentiality. Everybody has confidentiality with us. It is in my blood now. A lot of times police will call the center looking for missing people. And even if they're there, I have to say I cannot confirm or deny that I know that person. I've had judges put me on the stand trying to compel me to testify about my clients. And I have to say, I'm sorry, Your Honor, it's against the law for me to tell you what you're asking me to tell you. So we take confidentiality very seriously. Not just with what victims tell us, but who they are. And then self-determination. If people are coming out of controlling situations, who am I to further control them? I want to empower them to make their own choices. So I make sure that they are informed, they know the ins and outs of what their options are, we bounce ideas off of each other, we make pros and cons lists, okay, is this gonna be good, is this gonna be good? But ultimately, that person is the one to make those decisions. And we also create a judgment-free environment. Because we know it takes on average seven to nine times for a victim to leave abuse, they can come to us as many times as they want. I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to say, well, it didn't work the last time, so here you are again. I'm not going to do that. I'm gonna go, okay, let's go, I'm ready. Anytime they need help, we're going to help them and we won't turn them away because they've returned to their abusers. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you, for everybody. Thank you to everybody for being so attentive. Because of COVID, I only brought a few brochures. If you want a physical brochure, I have some. But I also created this, this URL right here. If you want to take a picture of it, put it in your phone. It contains this entire presentation, which includes references of the studies that I mentioned before. It also includes every single one of our brochures, about all of our programs, a copy of the Power and Control Wheel. This is my contact information and our 24-7 crisis hotline right there. If anybody has any questions or anything they want to say, I'm going to stick around for a few minutes. Um, so thank you guys. Have a good night.